Good morning, everyone. Um, please join me in prayer as we come before God's word today. Father, how grateful we are for this opportunity to be in your presence, to be among your people. This opportunity to cry out to you in worship. This opportunity to set our minds, attention and our hearts' affection on you. This opportunity to say things to you and about you that we know and believe to be true. Father, we praise you for who you are and what you've done. We pray that you would speak to us clearly and powerfully through your word. Father, it's our desire to hear you and it's our desire to do what you say. Teach us this morning about what it means to confess Jesus as Christ, as Messiah, as Lord, as Saviour, and then to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. Conform us to the image of Christ in whose precious name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Well, good morning. And where do I start in um, the strange times that we find ourselves? As we look around the world, there is great suffering and sadness. And yet today, as followers of Jesus, our hearts are filled with joy as we remember that Christ is risen. This week has brought a huge growth in the number of confirmed cases of COVID-19 and mounting death toll. All across the world, many people are living in anxiety and fear as they face an invisible enemy which brings death. And even as followers of Jesus, it's appropriate for us to take this seriously. We don't need to fear death, but it's understandable that we're concerned. And that concern can be significantly increased if we spend too much time looking at the news or social media. Coronavirus extends its reach to all the corners of the globe, screamed one headline this week. But as we reflect today on the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his triumph over sin and death, I want to remind us of another silent pandemic that has infected the entire world. And although I certainly don't want to make light of COVID-19, the disease I'm referring to is far more significant. As serious as coronavirus is, the disease I'm referring to has infected everyone on the planet and has a 100% mortality rate. Do I have your attention now? The most serious pandemic in our world is sin, not the coronavirus. Sin, the serious offence that we commit against a holy God by not being like him and not obeying him. Sin, a disease that entered our world through Adam and Eve. Sin, a disease that has infected the entire human race. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, as Paul tells us in Romans 3.23. Sin, a disease that has a 100% mortality rate, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. Sin, a disease that few people take seriously because its ultimate consequences have a lengthy incubation period and its effects are not all immediate. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world that doesn't deal well with things that don't have immediate consequences. One of our uniquely human tendencies is to kick the can down the road, knowing that we can deal with the consequences of things later, or maybe not at all. But trust me, this is not one of those things that you want to deal with later. As we've been reminded this week, there may not always be a later. Because of our sin, death is coming to all of us, even followers of Jesus. And despite what some in the charismatic church would have you believe, the Bible doesn't promise us health, wealth and happiness in this life. We're not promised that. But we are promised something so much greater. That in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Through sickness, through suffering, and even through death, God is working that he might be glorified and that we might be conformed to the image of Christ. 
even through coronavirus and the death it may cause, Jesus is building his church. Our Heavenly Father is calling his chosen ones to himself and shaping his people into Christ-likeness. So if we trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus, his righteous life is credited to us. The perfect sacrifice of his life pays the penalty for our sin. God's wrath is poured out on Jesus, the spotless lamb, so that God's anger might pass over those of us who trust in him. Brothers and sisters, when we trust in the blood of Jesus, the miracle is not being spared from coronavirus. The true miracle is found in these words from Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are being called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Brothers and sisters, which, with such confidence, we don't need to be afraid of things that can kill the body. Knowing that we're called by God with an effectual call and that he cannot let us go, we certainly don't need to be afraid of the coronavirus. And we don't need to be afraid of death either. As David says in Psalm 23, Even though I walk through the valley of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As followers of Jesus, we are heirs to these wonderful promises. But what does it mean to follow Jesus? Well, today we're going to spend some time looking at what Jesus requires of his followers. But first, as we come to today's passage, let's spend a couple of minutes reminding ourselves where we are in the context of Matthew's Gospel. Last week, Ben looked at Peter's remarkable statement on behalf of the disciples in response to Jesus' question. As we reach the apex of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus asks, but who do you say I am? And Peter, the guy who puts his foot into his mouth at every available opportunity, the man I think we can all relate to in his bumbling humanness, Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Peter has never been so clear or so right. Jesus is the Christ. The promised Messiah that the Jews have been awaiting for thousands of years. And like Peter, many of us make that same confession. As Paul says in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is... Um, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess that Jesus died and was raised and you walk obediently with him as Lord over your life, then you have assurance of salvation. You know where you will be spending eternity, in heaven, worshipping and giving glory to God. But note in Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, where our understanding of this truth comes from. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Like Peter, if we confess Jesus as Lord, then this isn't something that we did by ourselves. In order to recognize Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, God first has to call us to reveal himself to us. When we confess Christ, it's because God the Father first called us. And having called us, he will not, he cannot let us go. So what great confidence we can draw from Jesus' words in verse 18, where he says, I will build my church. Not great music will build the church, not a fantastic kids program will build the church. Not a pastor with skinny jeans and tattoos will build the church. Although maybe it's worth a thought, Ben. 
and not an accessible, seeker-sensitive message will build the church. No. Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And with the phrase, the gates of Hades, Jesus is using a Jewish expression that refers to death. I will build my church and death will not overpower it. In God's sovereignty, even death doesn't get in the way of his plans. Even in the face of persecution and the death of the saints, Jesus will continue to build his church. In fact, in God's sovereignty, death is sometimes part of his plans for his ultimate glory. And so if this is true, then we truly have nothing to fear. As followers of Christ, coronavirus holds no fear for us. Death holds no fear for us. Not because we have a promise that we, don't, that we won't die. We're not promised that. But because we can confidently say with Paul in the words of 1 Corinthians 15:55, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Death is not the end. Death is not the end for us. We have an assurance of eternity with God an eternity without sin or death or mourning or crying or pain, an eternity of worshipping God. And as Paul says in Philippians, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Death is not the end for us and death is not the end for the church. I will build my church and death will not overpower it. In the words of John MacArthur, the church is the very reason for the existence of the universe. Did you get that? The church is the very reason for the existence of the universe. God's purpose for the world is to redeem a people as a bride for his son. The church of Jesus Christ, his bride is the great lasting empire of this world. Not the Medes or the Persians or the Babylonians or the Romans or heaven forbid even the British. The church of Jesus Christ is the great lasting empire of this world. And even if it's ravaged by persecution and suffering and plagues, Jesus will continue to build his church. So why then, if Peter rightly acknowledges Jesus as God's chosen Messiah, does Jesus warn the disciples in verse 20 that they should warn no one that he's the Christ? Well, as we've seen previously in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus knows that people have the wrong view of what the Messiah will be like and what he's coming to do. The Jewish people are expecting a military, political and social leader who will overthrow their Roman oppressors and usher in the glorious era of Old Testament promises. They're expecting a triumphant Messiah, not the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And with that expectation, there's a risk that the people will get in the way of what Jesus has really come to do, to suffer to die and to rise again. There's a risk that, as we see in John chapter 6, the people will try to make him king by force. And that's not the kind of Messiah that Jesus is, at least not yet. So as we come to today's passage, we see that it's not just the Jewish people who are expecting the wrong kind of Messiah. The disciples, despite acknowledging that Jesus is the Christ, don't have a good idea of what that means. If you could open your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, and let's read from verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. 
Now, this isn't the first time that Jesus alludes to his death, but it is the first time that he discusses it openly. And note the language that he uses in verse 21. He must go to Jerusalem. In line with his father's will and with Old Testament prophecy, Jesus must do this. It must happen. It is part of God's sovereign plan. And it's interesting that it comes immediately after Peter's acknowledgement of Jesus as the Christ. Now that Jesus' identity is confirmed to his disciples, he wants them to understand what sort of Messiah he is. And he's not the immediately triumphant military, social, political leader that they're expecting. A concept that's going to take these disciples a while to get their head around. Remember that a few chapters in Matthew 20, we'll see the disciples continue to jostle for position in Jesus' kingdom. The mother of James and John asks if they can sit on Jesus' right and left in his kingdom. So even later on in Matthew's gospel, this is still for them a kingdom that's about power and status. They're still struggling to understand that Jesus' kingdom is one where the first will be last and the last will be first. A kingdom where triumph is achieved through suffering and humiliation. A kingdom where in order to live eternally, you need to die to your old self. A kingdom where so many things seem to be upside down. So Peter, with these wrong ideas of who the Messiah is and what his kingdom is like, begins to rebuke Jesus, verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now this is the same Peter who just acknowledged Jesus Christ. Only a few verses ago, he was doing so well. And yet, minutes later, Peter has the audacity to rebuke the man he's just confessed to be the Messiah. And this is more than not understanding what kind of Messiah Jesus is. Peter is doing the work of Satan in actually trying to stop Jesus fulfilling God's plan. Verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests but man's. Note the contrast here. A few verses ago, Peter was Petros, a small rock, a small stone, contrasted with Petra, the rock on which the church is built. But now Peter is a different kind of stone. He's a stumbling block. From speaking the truth that is the foundation of the church to opposing God's sovereign plan in a few short verses. And as, Peter, as Jesus rebukes Peter with the statement, get behind me, Satan, we see Satan's last desperate attempt to stop Jesus going to the cross. Satan, the adversary of God, the fallen angel who wants to usurp God and take the glory that's due to him, trying to thwart God's plan of redemption. Peter isn't literally Satan, but he's speaking Satan's plan out loud to Jesus. You don't need to die. This can't happen to you. You're supposed to be a triumphant Messiah. This is humiliating. But Jesus isn't falling for this, and he can immediately see Satan's hand in Peter's words. Jesus knows God's plan and that it must happen. And the next few verses show that Jesus not only knows that he must die, but what kind of death he's going to die. Read with me from verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Verse 24 shows us that not only does Jesus know the excruciating death 
that he's going to suffer on the cross, but that he has expectations of his followers. Being a follower of Jesus is more than just speaking words. It's more than intellectually agreeing to who Jesus is. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus says, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe, yes, but first comes repentance. A turning away from our former sin-soaked lives. Look with me again at verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This verse challenges so much of the prosperity gospel teaching that we see in many Australian churches today. Teaching that God wants you to be healthy, wealthy and happy. Teaching that paints Jesus as a magic genie who can get you what you want. That Christianity is about what you can get out of it. That Christianity exists to give you your best life now. Brothers and sisters, the only way we will have our best life now is if we're going to hell. This verse is the exact opposite of what false churches and false teachers are offering. This verse makes it crystal clear that coming after Jesus involves recognising your own absolute inability to reach God by yourself. You need to live for Christ rather than yourself. You need to be prepared to face suffering even to the point of death. And you'll need to walk in obedience to Christ. So let's take a deeper look at what it means to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus. Firstly, the word deny means to disown. To come to Jesus, we have to disown ourselves to be done with the person that we have been. True repentance means giving up all of the desires, dreams and efforts of our former life. It means being broken in spirit. As we see at the beginning of the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount, recognising that we bring absolutely nothing to our salvation. It's totally undeserved and all we can do is offer up the empty hands of faith. Denying ourselves means taking Christ on his terms, not on ours. It means being content with anything and giving thanks to God in all circumstances. It means not envying others. It means not keeping a record of wrongs against ourselves. It means not fighting back. It means being happy to receive correction and rebuke from others of less stature than ourselves. It means being happy to be unknown. Brothers and sisters, denying yourself is not easy. We can't do it in our own strength. And as we grow in grace, we become increasingly conscious of our own sin, of our unworthiness before a holy God, of our need for grace. And as we reflect on Jesus' triumphant death and resurrection on this Easter Sunday, I want us to examine our own hearts. Denying yourself isn't easy. And as I've wrestled with these verses over the past few weeks, I'm reminded of just how often I don't deny myself, of how selfish my motives often are, of my tendency to trust in my own strength and my own works. And how seriously I need to take the work of denying myself and following Jesus. So let me ask you the same questions. Are you trusting in Jesus' finished work on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, knowing that there is nothing you have done that deserves God's grace? Or do you still, deep down, think that God's grace is something you really deserve? Are you dying to yourself so that God might be glorified in you? Or are you still fundamentally living for yourself above all things? This verse really exposes the motives of our hearts, doesn't it? Next, let's take a look at what it means to take up our cross. 
Now, there's a risk here that we see taking up our cross as figurative language, as a metaphor for the difficult things in life, the struggles that we have to put up with as being, part of being a Christian. But I want to be clear here, struggling with a lack of toilet paper is not taking up your cross. Putting up with your mother-in-law is not taking up your cross. Having to put up with people taunting you for being a Christian is not taking up your cross. Jesus is talking about actual, literal death. Jesus is saying that we should love him so much that we should be prepared to follow him to death. And not just any death, humiliating, tortured, excruciating death. Brothers and sisters, if we deny ourselves and take up our cross, then we love Jesus as Lord so much. We love his salvation and it's so precious to us that in comparison our life doesn't even matter. And make no mistake, the disciples knew exactly what Jesus was talking about here. Crucifixion was a common form of punishment for the Romans, the painful death of a criminal. And as followers of Jesus, this is what we need to be ready for, not health, wealth and happiness, but to experience suffering before we experience triumph, to experience humiliation before we are glorified, to experience persecution, shame and reproach before we can be with God for eternity. Brothers and sisters, this is the path we take in following Jesus, to win by losing and to follow him in obedience. I'm reminded of a cartoon I saw recently where the disciples were all on their mobile phones and Jesus, an exasperated looking Jesus said to them, was saying to them, no, I literally want you to follow me. This is not the kind of following that Jesus wants. When Jesus says, follow me, it's a command that requires immediate and total action. Do you remember when Jesus called Peter and his brother Andrew to follow him back in Matthew chapter 4? Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Immediately. Not tomorrow when they've sorted out a few things. Not later. Immediately. Are you prepared to drop everything from your old life and follow Jesus immediately? And not just immediately, following Jesus requires constant and total obedience. Followers of Jesus are marked out by obedience. In John chapter 8 verse 31 we read, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. It's not enough to just say the words, Jesus is Lord. Remember the words of Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. As followers of Jesus, we need to walk in obedience to his words. Brothers and sisters, again, I encourage you to examine your hearts. Are you walking worthy of the calling that you have received? Are you obedient to the words of Jesus? Are you denying yourself and putting to death sin in your life? If you are, then you have nothing to fear. If not, then you need to pay particular attention to these next few verses. Let's read verses 25 and 26 again. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? This is the danger of the way that the world thinks. If you want your best life now, then that's what you'll get. And this is the danger of the prosperity gospel. If you want your best life now, then that's what you'll get. Jesus is so clear in this passage. Coming to Christ will cost you. It will cost you everything you have 
and everything that you are. And by dying to your old self, you will find life. But do you know what? It's hard, isn't it? It's so hard. And it's easy to think that we can hang on to parts of our old life, that we can keep walking in our sins, in our old way of life. Just a couple of sins. It doesn't matter. I'm saved, we tell ourselves. Brothers and sisters, it does matter. Stop hanging on. Stop trying to save your life. Stop living for yourself. Stop trying to reach God in your own strength. Remember these words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. In the eternal scheme of things, brothers and sisters, coronavirus doesn't matter. Death doesn't matter. What matters is the status of our eternal soul and in whose strength we stand before God at the final judgment. And if you think you can stand before God in your own strength, then you're going to forfeit your soul. The Bible is clear that you will spend eternity being punished in hell. So I beg you today, if you're not in a right relationship with Jesus, then please carefully consider what I'm saying, because the time is coming when it's going to be too late to make this right. Let's look at verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Jesus wasn't going to be the kind of Messiah that the disciples were expecting. He was a suffering servant, not a triumphant military, social, political leader. But that's not the end of the story. Having triumphed over sin and death at the cross, Jesus is coming back again. And he's coming back as the kind of Messiah that they were originally expecting and so much more. He's not going to be just a military, social, political leader. He's coming in the glory of his Father with his angels, with unimaginable power and holiness. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And when he comes, it will be too late. And those of us following him have nothing to fear. We long for his coming. But for people not confessing Jesus as Lord and not walking in obedience, you should be very afraid. Because if you think coronavirus is scary, you haven't seen anything yet. If you're not relying on the blood of Jesus, then you will be repaid according to your works. And I don't know about you, but I can tell you this. If I was repaid for my works, it wouldn't go well. So remember these trustworthy words from the mouth of our Saviour and Lord. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. But how do we know that Jesus' words are true? How do we know that Jesus is really going to come back in this way? Well, read with me from verse 28. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now there are a lot of different views on the meaning of this verse, but I think it's actually quite straightforward. At the start of the next passage in Matthew 17, we see the transfiguration. Jesus' face shines like the sun and his clothes become white as light. And he is standing with Moses and Elijah. And the fact that this verse 28 comes straight before the transfiguration is no coincidence. In verse 28, Jesus is referring to his transfiguration. And his transfiguration is a preview of the second coming. A preview showing the kind of Messiah Jesus will be when he returns. A holy, glorious, powerful Messiah. A terrifying Messiah. And when the disciples see him transfigured, they fall down, face down to the ground, and are terrified. 
Brothers and sisters, we know that the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels because he gave a preview of his second coming at the Transfiguration. And having seen this, the disciples willingly followed Jesus through suffering and ultimately to death for what they believed. We might not have seen Jesus transfigured, but we will. When he returns, he will be in glory and it will be unmistakable. He will make all things new. He will take away all suffering. We will be given new healthy bodies and we will live with him forever, giving glory to God. Brothers and sisters, don't fear coronavirus. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that your scripture is clear and that as we seek you, your spirit is at work in us, convicting us and changing us. Help us not to fear this world or things that can destroy the body, but help us to have a right fear of you. Father, many of us continue to hang on to parts of our old sinful life. In your strength, help us to renew our commitment to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus. In his precious name we pray. Amen.